Okay. Um, so I'm here obviously representing Ubuntu and Canonical. The great thing about OpenStack is th th the, the way it has become a center of gravity for the entire industry. You know, every vendor in the world needs to understand how their products will fit into an OpenStack world. Because to the extent that people are running their own infrastructure, we believe they will be running it um, with OpenStack. OpenStack is going to be at the center of all private infrastructure and a lot of public infrastructure um, in, in years to come. So the energy that you see here really is driving, um, is, is driving that. Um, so just in terms of perspective, what do we see, or, you know, what's our perspective on the cloud from, from Ubuntu? Well, we, we have a very central perspective on what people are doing both on public cloud in terms of how they run their workloads on top of cloud. About 70% of all of the workloads that are running on public clouds today are, um, are, are based on Ubuntu. And we study and work with a lot of the institutions, some of the very largest ones, guys like Netflix, uh, as well as the startups. Um, who we hope will go on to become sort of industry game changers. Um, and we study very much what, they, what they're looking for for a platform on top of the cloud. But we also now increasingly are um, right at the center of the largest OpenStack deployments. Um, the latest OpenStack survey uh, found pretty much the same thing as, as they did in 2013. About 55% of the production deployments um, uh, of OpenStack today are on Ubuntu. Um, this number didn't change much. It was interesting over the last six months between Hong Kong and Atlanta. Um, and we increasingly see a, a huge pipeline of people who, who rapidly moving through proof of concept, uh, beta, pilot, and, uh, and, and moving to production use um, for OpenStack. Um, Ubuntu was the first distribution to embrace OpenStack, to move it to the center of its sort of cloud offerings. But again, I think what's, what's valuable about OpenStack is that it has attracted every distribution of Linux. It's attracted Microsoft. You can build OpenStack on Windows. Uh, it's attracted Oracle. You can build OpenStack on Solaris. Um, it really is a sort of central feature of the landscape. But Ubuntu is, and our positioning for Ubuntu is very much about scale out, right? We're, we're interested in anybody who's doing um, work at scale. Working at scale is different to working, you know, in the old way. It requires you to think very differently. It requires you to value different things. So we're very interested in how Google, Amazon, Azure, Microsoft, how the, those clouds are built. We study those a lot. And we're very interested in how businesses are run when they run at scale. And a lot of what we learn from that gets distilled into the platform, or a lot of what we, we do in the platform is specifically to meet the needs of people who are doing that. So if you look at the top 10,000 sites in the world by traffic, um, Ubuntu is the number one platform for those sites as well. Um, OpenStack and Ubuntu go back to the extent that there's a very tight alignment between the way OpenStack is released and the way Ubuntu is released. Um, this means, this alignment means that you're, you're guaranteed two things. First, if you're a developer of OpenStack, that you can always access the latest OpenStack bits on the latest Ubuntu release. But also, if you're deploying it in production, it also means you can always get the latest OpenStack bits on the latest enterprise release, LTS release of Ubuntu. And we maintain that alignment um, really, really closely. Um, it's very important for us to support developers, right? We, um, um, as, a, as a relatively new entrant to enterprise Linux, um, developers are our lifeblood. And also, the culture of our company is very much focused on developer enablement, um, making developers go faster. So we just released 14.04 LTS with Icehouse, but at the same time, we, we published Icehouse for 12.04. Um, so if you read this chart, what that means is that you, anybody who had deployed 12.04 and, say, Havana or Grizzly can be upgrading to Icehouse without changing from 12.04, and then they could upgrade to 14.04 and continue getting the newer versions of, um, of OpenStack. So there's a very clear pattern for how you build OpenStack on Ubuntu, always getting either the latest stable or the latest developer release of Ubuntu, and then the latest OpenStack bits. Um, again, the, the key thing for us as a platform, you know, as a, a key focus for us as a platform is vendor interoperability. Um, Jonathan talked about um, uh, the, the marketplace, the OpenStack marketplace. Increasingly, you know, it's interesting to know what kinds of components you can put into your cloud, 
Um, how can you build a cloud? You know, whose storage can you use? Whose networking can you use? Um, whose hypervisors can you use? Uh, and so on. What management options do you have? And for us, the, the, the key goal is to make sure that um, um, we, we can have a very high level of confidence that you can actually build a cloud in real time, like right now on the stage, um, with components from all of these different vendors. So we run a, a highly unusual interop program. I say it's highly unusual because classically, you know, interop certification was a one-time thing. You would certify a part, um, and then it was you know, up to the end user to figure out how to put all the parts together. Um, we don't do that. We actually build the cloud many times every day with, with randomly selected components from, from this um, list of vendors, and, 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 and there's a long queue of vendors joining this program, this interop lab as well. So, so in other words, our, you know, all of our effort goes into making sure that when you sit down to build a cloud, you can actually choose components from that, that, that list and you'll very easily be able to, um, to build uh, that cloud and have it work. Um, uh, I want to show you how we do that. I have over here a little cluster. This uh, orange box here um, is in fact a cluster of 10 physical microservers, 10 little Intel servers. Um, and for us to build a cloud on that is, is quite straightforward. We use an orchestration system um, sitting on top of a, a physical provisioning system. So this is the physical provisioning system, it's called MAS. You see one of the lights on that front of that box is on. So that's MAS running on one of those servers. Uh, anyone can set up MAS and we certify, all the servers that are certified with Ubuntu are certified to work with MAS as well. They can't get certified unless you can do this. Um, uh, with, your own, with, with those servers in your own data center. Um, so you can see the, the servers there. There's, there's 12 showing here just because we have two virtual machines also running on that first node um, providing some additional services. Um, and then this is an orchestration, um, an orchestration interface, um, but it's a sort of a blank canvas. So I could put anything on there and, uh, and it would get built out on those servers. But the, the interesting thing for us to put on there today is... Um, uh, is OpenStack. So let me just do, ha, huh, this is going to be fun. My screen resolution is much higher. Right, I should be able to do that. Hmm. All right, I'm going to ask someone to kick that behind the scenes. We might have a networking glitch. Um, all right, we'll give that a go. Um, this is, in fact, just a little text file that describes OpenStack. And so in here, I'm showing each of the different services that I want to deploy on those physical machines and the, um, and the configuration of those services on the machine. So I'm taking standardized services and mapping them to the physical infrastructure over there. Um, and let's see. All right, here we go. So what you'll see over the next couple of minutes is a series of services being spun up on that. Each of the machines will be turned on. The operating system will be installed from scratch. The services will be deployed on that and then connected and configured um, into a working OpenStack. Uh, and what we showed in Atlanta um, was that you could do this with any operating system. You could do this with Ubuntu or CentOS or Windows. Um, and in fact, any component of OpenStack can then be running um, on, on any of those operating systems. So it really starts to give us the ability dynamically to create OpenStack. This is how we run that interop lab, right? We can dynamically create OpenStack clouds um, of any number of different um, permutations and configurations and increasingly operating systems hypervisors and so on. So that's how we give sort of substance to that promise that you can, you can pick any of these vendor components um, and build an OpenStack cloud with those components from those vendors. Um, if there are folks here who would like their components essentially below the line in people's OpenStack clouds on Ubuntu, then please come and, come and see me or someone else from Canonical about that, that Interop Lab oil. Um, uh, we give those vendors um, amazing insight into where they need to focus in order to build, you know, be part of the sorts of clouds that the largest guys are building. There are, in fact, four different paths to OpenStack on, on Ubuntu. 
Um, if you are someone who likes to sort of build everything from scratch yourself to see how they work, you can obviously take the code and just deploy the code from, from Git straight onto, onto Ubuntu. And you can be pretty confident that that will work because a, a very large percentage of OpenStack developers themselves do it um, on Ubuntu. Uh, but we publish packages. Um, anybody who knows um, Ubuntu will know apt-get. You can apt-get any component of OpenStack straight onto uh, Ubuntu. And we publish um, a, a cloud archive, a supplemental cloud archive, um, which has uh, uh, each sequential release of OpenStack for both you know, 12.04 and 14.04, and then we'll do the same for 16.04. So that's how you would build a cloud yourself if you wanted to do it manually. And of course, you can use whatever your preferred tooling is um, for, for deployment at scale. Um, you know, people will often do it manually the first time at small scale, and then they'll automate that on top. Um, um, you can also use this mechanism, right? You can use Juju, which is a higher level orchestration system. Juju is a service orchestration system, so it's a level up from things like Chef or Puppet. Uh, and Juju was actually born on EC2. Um, we studied, uh, we were studying what people were doing with Ubuntu on EC2, and we saw that they were all starting to try to automate with Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, CF Engine, you know, any number of things, Python Bash. Um, but there was a tremendous amount of duplication um, in their efforts. In other words, each group that was sitting down to do Hadoop was essentially recoding operation, operational Hadoop practice. Each person that was sitting down to do um, uh, uh, Logstash or Kibana or Elasticsearch was doing it essentially from scratch. And that was enormously wasteful. Uh, and, and our sort of culture of trying to help people go faster made, 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 you know, led us to want to create something which, you know, again, came up a level with an extra layer of abstraction to allow for much greater reuse of standardized components that included not just the software. So, you know, these boxes here are not like packages. They don't just encode the software. It's not like apt-get where you just get the software. But they actually encode operational practice as well, how you back stuff up, how you connect and, con and integrate pieces. And so, you know, as this picture fills out, what's actually happening is software is being installed, typically using apt-get, but then you're also getting real-time integration of components. So this is all born on EC2. Um, all of those, Juju itself is open source, and um, all of those charms, charms are sort of the package equivalent that includes the operational stuff, all of those are open source as well. And you can, you can essentially manually do that. You know, you can take your cluster and you can say Juju deploy Nova on these machines and Juju deploy Swift on those machines and then add the relationships uh, and have the charms essentially integrate everything. What that means is you get complete architectural freedom. So if you have an architecture in mind of different services in different, in different places in the data center, you can place those services exactly where you want. And the reason that's important is because iteration is the only way to get architecture right. You know, you, you, no, nobody, nobody gets a cloud architecture right the first time around. Um, it surprises you. Performance is, you know, the performance characteristics of any given architecture are always surprising. So the secret is to do it many times, right? The secret is to be able to build it quickly, then tear it, study it, and then tear it down and build it again. And that also lets you try components from different vendors. It lets you try different, um, different network architectures, different physical architectures, and so on. Um, but it does mean that you have to have an architectural view, right? So this, this approach is great for people who have architects because you know, they, they have opinions and you want to follow their opinions. Um, if you don't have architects, though, OpenStack can be challenging because um, uh, you know, it's a whole new sort of universe of, of, of components and tools that your existing sort of administrators have to, have to understand on top of all the workload work that they do every day. Um, and so for that reason, we've, we've essentially distilled out a reference deployment of architecture, which is unusual, uh, of OpenStack, which is unusual in that it's, it's codified in a way that allows it to dynamically adapt to your hardware. So this is the third version over here, the reference install, is something that is available to our customers. It's built into the management system for Ubuntu that our customers use. And it essentially will analyze the hardware and then based on you know, what we've learned from very large deployments of OpenStack, it will allocate the services to that hardware and it'll build a reference cloud. Uh, it's not perfect. 
Um, but it has set some records. We announced in Atlanta that you know, we, we, we deployed 168,000 VMs over the course of about 11 hours onto a small cloud, uh, 500 odd nodes, um, that, that was, the, was built with this architecture essentially. So it's not perfect, but it certainly does scale. It certainly includes um, all of the best practices that come from the very large telco clouds that we're involved in. Um, and it certainly you know, will evolve probably faster than anything that a small organization might do for themselves if they don't have deep you know, architectural expertise. Um, because it's built into landscape, essentially, we will evolve that. So as landscape evolves, we will update the code, we'll update the reference architecture, and, and this infrastructure knows how to manage itself. So it can, it can scale over time, it can evolve its own architecture over time um, as we learn how to make that cloud better and better. And then, of course, you can work with someone completely independent. There are multiple other companies that are building OpenStack solutions that use Ubuntu. Um, and, you know, we're very happy if you work with one of them. Um, we think that a, an open ecosystem generally generates more ideas. And, uh, and the, the real battle here is not between Linux distros um, or OpenStack distros. The real battle is uh, to make private cloud um, sustainable and exciting and a viable alternative to, to, to public cloud. So we're very happy to work with lots of great companies um, to bring OpenStack to a larger audience. Um, there's a very large list of companies now that are building um, um, on Ubuntu. The numbers you know, are 55%, but if you look at the large companies, um, I'm very proud that you know, we support the, the vast majority of the big deployments. All of the companies that Jonathan mentioned um, are on Ubuntu, we certainly have Ubuntu inside OpenStack. Um, although they'll use every other operating system, right? It wouldn't be a great cloud if it, if it didn't support every operating system. Um, and, uh, and many of the ones that we think are going to be real trendsetters coming down the pike, um, you know, will add to this list of names. Um, and those are production commercial deployments, you know, those are, those are deployments which um, are mission critical to those companies. There are other vendors involved as well, so we, we, we take our responsibilities there very seriously. Deutsche Telekom, Time Warner. So Deutsche Telekom is interesting because this is really is the next generation network, um, uh, all IP. Um, it's, it's a very pioneering effort in Europe, across Europe, um, to, to define what a next generation telco network would look like. Um, all the services are, are IP based, no proprietary protocols, no proprietary infrastructure, very, very open, very, very agile, very, very fast, really interesting project. Uh, Time Warner is interesting. They're, they're, uh, there's a whole class of media companies. Jonathan mentioned Disney, but Comcast, Time Warner, um, Guardian, lots of lots of media companies moving to OpenStack. I don't know if media is a big sector here in Israel, but it certainly is a fast-moving sector for, for OpenStack globally. Uh, NEC is a, a telco equipment provider and cloud solution provider, all built um, on Ubuntu. And NTT, which has a big research division uh, doing a lot of networking research on next generation network capabilities, SDNs, uh, and obviously building a, a cloud uh, themselves. Um, so why do they choose Ubuntu? Uh, it's a combination of things. On the R&D front, from a sort of science and technology point of view, we have a good track record of delivering stuff that matters um, to our users first. Uh, we're the first distro to integrate KVM as the, as the recommended hypervisor. Um, the first to integrate Ceph. Today we lead LXC, which is a generic hy uh, a, a, a hypervisorless, containerized um, uh, scale-out solution. Think of, a think of virtualization without the overhead of the virtual machine, essentially. Um, we pioneered cloud in it, which is how you essentially take standardized um, images of now any operating system and bootstrap those up to being um, sort of uh, do the workload that you specifically want to. Um, and we did a lot of work on things like live migration and so on to meet customer requirements. Our, our focus, you know, our R&D focus is very much ba driven by what people are actually running into in production, either on the public cloud or the private cloud. Those of you who haven't played with LXC I just want to take a moment to, to tell you just how incredibly awesome containers are. Um, uh, you can sit down at certainly a, a Ubuntu 1404, but you'll find LXC on other distros as well. In fact, I think there are 60 different companies that participate in LXC. 
Um, uh, you can sit down at Ubuntu 14.04 and you can spin up in less than a second a container of CentOS or a container of Debian or a container of Ubuntu. As long as you're doing Linux on Linux, this is the way to, 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 to do scale out. It's amazing. Um, and in terms of scale, um, you know, we, we, one of our guys led a, a security contest recently, a sort of a global capture the flag type concept contest. And to, um, to, to make that interesting, they simulated the entire internet, by which I mean they, they simulated having every major router on the internet available. They essentially created a microcosm of the entire internet. It was kind of incredible. And that whole thing ran on you know, a, a couple of big servers um, with thousands of containers, thousands of containers. Each container thought it was a full machine. It was running routing protocols. And they'd literally simulated the internet with, with ping times, delay times. They simulated the speed of light, the laws of physics. It was kind of incredible. And then on top of that, they ran this, this global kind of capture the flag context, contest. It was really, really cool. So you can do amazing things. People are doing amazing things with LXC. And uh, it's, the, it's the underlying primitive for a lot of the work that's happening around PaaS um, and, and sort of really accelerating agility. So here's a point that I think is really easy to lose sight of in all of the excitement. Um, say, say you're a medium-sized organization, you've got a couple, couple of hundred servers, you know, 10, 15, 20 system administrators um, looking after your, your Linux workloads, right? So you've got this Linux workload story. And now CIO comes along and says, he wants all of that running on the cloud, he wants all of that running on OpenStack. So you've got all of your workloads, and now suddenly your, your system administration team has to has to take care of this extra layer underneath. Um, it's the same physical servers. In fact, you'll probably get better density. We've always seen that people get better density when they move to OpenStack. Um, you, you'll see that the, the number of workloads accelerates dramatically. Um, but fundamentally, it's the same sort of number of machines, and it's the same number of workloads, but you have this extra layer. If the economics of that extra layer push you way out of line with the public cloud, you're in real trouble, because the next thing the CIO will say is, this is what it would cost us to do it you know, on the public cloud. This is what you're costing me. Let's move it to the public cloud. And so there's a, there's a really hard constraint on how you build your private cloud, how you build your open stack. You have to understand the, 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 the tolerance of the institution for an additional premium, if there's going to be a premium associated with doing it privately, doing it on your, on, on your own infrastructure. And so understanding the costs is really important. Um, uh, the way we structure that is one of two ways. We do it by our availability zone. So in other words, we price um, for, a, for a cluster essentially based on a certain amount of scale, but capping it. And so all the largest guys tend to go for this. If you aspire to scale, this is the model to use. And then for smaller organizations, we do it on a fully managed basis. So it's entirely predictable on a cost per day per server so that you, can, you know exactly what that open stack is going to cost you. And then you can do the calculus as to whether or not that's worth doing um, relative to uh, the public cloud. Um, we've seen some very ambitious, very competent, very big companies run into, run into trouble where they go and build a private cloud. And, and, and as they start bidding internally um, against public cloud vendors, they, they, they lose if they haven't got the economics um, right. The other big thing to bear in mind is interop. Um, you, you, you know, we are going to live in a heterogeneous world forever. And today, the, the two big other pools that are important out there are ESX, VMware, um, and Hyper-V, Microsoft. They are just important pieces of infrastructure. And we work very closely with both companies because we understand um, that dynamic. Um, we have constructive relationships in both, in both directions there. When you build your first OpenStack, you know, you'll, 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 you'll get it up and running. As it becomes a production bit of infrastructure for you, and it very quickly becomes a production bit of infrastructure for you, these are the issues that you'll, that you'll run into. Uh, you will need to do live upgrades. And so you should have a plan going in for how you're going to do live upgrades. You, know, you, can't, you can't be running an infrastructure that you can't update. Right? Elasticity is one half of that. Operational practice is the other. Uh, you will want to upgrade from OpenStack version to OpenStack version. Those numbers that Jonathan put up are extraordinary, and that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of that is rounding out. You know, it's adding additional components that you won't use, but a lot of it is enhancing the core as well, and you will use that no matter how you built your cloud. So you will want to upgrade from version to version, and so having a clear strategy for that, I think, is really important. You do need to think about the guest experience. You know, nobody builds a cloud to have a cloud. They build it for what they want to get done with it. 
And so you have to think about what the guest experience is going to be. If you get this wrong, your cloud is unusable. It works, but it's unusable. Um, and you have to essentially operationalize it. It has to, it has to, has to live and breathe. That the innovation, what people do with the cloud, is my real passion, right? You know, I think there are lots of people, you've got a phenomenal set of speakers here, great technical insights into how OpenStack works or what's cool about the guts of OpenStack. Um, I'm not going to try and do that for you. But what I am going to appeal to is your sense of the possible, you know, what's incredible that you can do with OpenStack. These are companies doing stuff with Ubuntu and the cloud generally, and increasingly with, with, with OpenStack. Um, I talked a little bit about the extent to which people choose OpenStack um, uh, or choose Ubuntu for the cloud. This is the thing that I think the thoughtful people are really interested in, right? This is, this is a ratio um, that should, should get you thinking. And this is the, the, the ratio, the relative ratios of the number of human beings to the number of physical servers in Google and most other institutions. Um, in Facebook, the number is 24,000. One person to 24,000 servers. Um, I don't know what your ratios are, but I'm guessing that you look a lot more like the guy on the left than Google, right? Because most institutions look a lot more like the guy on the left. And that is the profound challenge of this time because when all the dust is settled and the, you know, when all's said and done, ultimately it boils down to your ability to deliver innovation and your ability to do so with in, in a highly efficient manner. So that's why you know a lot of so much of my attention goes into helping people automate, helping people orchestrate, helping people um, acquire technology and innovation and operational capability without acquiring people. If you have to go and hire three people to set up your big data cluster, right, just to set up Hadoop, right, you've blown this budget. If you have to go and hire a bunch of people to set up your OpenStack, you've blown this budget. And if you blow this budget, you know, you're increasingly you, you're going to be out of step and out of touch with the times. So the key question really is, how does OpenStack change your life? It does change your life. The key question to think about is, how, what operationally do you do differently? If you just end up in a situation where you're doing what you were doing, and now you've got this extra layer, you've gone backwards, right? So the question is, like, what do you do differently operationally? And so that's why I've put you know, so much effort into this question of orchestration, right? An orchestration that spans all clouds. Um, this, was the, this was the winning entry into a Juju Charm Championship that we ran last year. Um, and it's how someone's reusing those standardized charms to create a pretty cool log analysis thing. So who's, who's used Splunk or seen Splunk, right? This is open source, open source Splunk. And you can spin this up in just a couple of minutes on any cloud or you know bare metal as well. Um, and you do that by, again, reusing these standardized components that come not just with the software, but with all of the integration coding essentially ready to go, um, connecting them up, and you've got essentially an open source Splunk. You can connect this to something similar for, for big data, and now you're essentially doing log analysis across your big data cluster. You can connect this to your OpenStack. So let's see. You can, you can go and connect that to your OpenStack cluster, and then you'll be doing essentially Splunk on your, um, on your OpenStack. So real-time integration of those capabilities is what's really critical. Um, this ecosystem of components that you can reuse is growing very, very rapidly. These are some of the companies that are either contributing to Juju itself, Juju Core, um, in fact, IBM's not on this list. We announced in Atlanta that, that IBM was um, contributing to Juju Core and charming up all of their key software so that you'll be able to use Juju to deploy and integrate in real time all of their key software. And we're also working with um, a range of partners um, that, that, that sell software through IBM um, to do the same thing. So this is the ecosystem of people who are now participating, consuming, or, or contributing to, to Juju in some way. Um, and it's, it continues to grow in a very um, dramatic way. The key thing, again, is to elevate the conversation, right? Two system administ administrators on opposite ends of the world need to be able to exchange information about um, uh, a complex deployment and 
um, and collaborate effectively. And so Juju gives us a language to describe that complex deployment, whether it's OpenStack, whether it's big data, whether it's Cloud Foundry, uh, it could be OpenShift, any kind of complex large-scale deployment. Juju gives us a model, a language to deploy that, to, 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 to have that conversation around. Um, it also gives, for example, academics a standardized way to describe a, a large-scale distributed software deployment so that they can write papers about it. You know, if you read these papers on distributed systems, distributed systems is the hot stuff. It's where all of the interesting stuff is happening. And a lot of that um, depends on a lot of our, our, our growing understanding of distributed systems depends on the ability for different groups to be able to reproduce exactly the same thing. So having a standardized way to to, to create a complex distributed workload, whether that's an end user workload, whether that's an infrastructure workload, doesn't really matter, is really important. Uh, and then the key thing is to be able to reuse your existing tools, reuse your existing scripts, your existing tools, your existing parts, and then just glue them together in a more predictable, more standardized kind of way. So, so this is really the goal of, of this work. Any workload could be infrastructure, could be the end user workload, could be you know, a service that you're gluing into a PaaS. Um, glued together, you know, that, that's built with any tool, any language, any, any, any configuration management tool. On bare metal or any cloud, so OpenStack um, is important, but so are all of the public clouds. So, so is all of the traditional hypervisors, or so are all of the traditional hypervisors, right? You need to be able to spin these orchestrations up on any hypervisor as well. Um, most recently, we, we announced that we'd be bringing Cloud Foundry into, into this ecosystem. In other words, you'll be able to Juju deploy Cloud Foundry. And the way that we did that is interesting. You know, Cloud Foundry is an open project. We're now uh, members of the, the foundation behind Cloud Foundry. And the standard thing that, you, that happens when you have a former foundation like that is everybody comes and sort of tries to put their own brand on it. So you see this with, with OpenStack. You know, there's an open source code base. We help set that up, get that going, support it. I mean, what you see is everybody coming in and trying to sort of do their, put their own brand on that thing. We, we don't like doing that. We like essentially to celebrate other people's brands, right? So the way we did Cloud Foundry is we're working with Pivotal. And you'll be able to Juju deploy a Pivotal Cloud Foundry and then get the Pivotal tool set on top of that. So, you know, we see ourselves as playing a much more humble role in those ecosystems. Right. I hope that was useful. I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much for the invitation. And all of the very best. <laughs>